this afternoon, I guess I should say, not evening. <laughs> um, so dark out, it almost looks like evening. Uh, we'll get started with her program, and uh, Betty Swingle has brought us this, so I'm going to let her introduce the program. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think any of you need to be introduced to Amalou. You probably all know her already, yeah. and you probably know that for years and years and years she's been interested in spinning fabrics, yarns, all that sort of thing. And most of you know that she did a dirty trick on us and moved away. <laughs> they lived in Fairfield for years and they had one of those beautiful brick homes down in Benton's Port where she had all of her wheels and all Lots of her materials. Lots of room for them. <laughs> yes. And now they absconded and went over to Lake Sujima, away from us all. I blame her husband for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she knows more about spinning wheels and spinning than most of us ever dreamed of. She also has a lot of materials that she would like to have you look at afterwards. Thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you all for coming out this afternoon on this rainy afternoon. So I was asked to talk to you on spinning wheels and spinning and some of the history of spinning. And I'll tell you first basically what a spinning wheel is. A spinning wheel is basically to twist a fiber on into a thread to be used in the making of textiles. And I can think of no other basic tool that was designed in as many thousands of forms for the same usage and product. Now this museum has a nice collection of different tools that are used in the fiber making. And the very earliest thing that was used was a spindle. And it's a stick with a whorl on it I'll just grab this one. It has some yarn on it. And um, I guess I'll wait and demonstrate this later. I might tell you one of the names for this is a drop spindle, and I've gotten pretty good at dropping it when I'm trying to show. But it, you twi twist it and pull the, the fiber out. And I'll give you a little more of the history of these. It can be it can be rotated or twisted by hand to spin the yarn or thread. And in its most primitive form it is a branch pulled from a tree or a rock picked up from the ground. In its most common form, it is somewhat like a top. It has a straight shaft with a weight attached to give added momentum. And along with the primitive weapons, and uh, lost my place such as the axe and the knife, it is probably the oldest and most widely used tool of the human race. Spindle whorls have been found which date back to 4000 BC in the Valley of the Nile. The date generally accorded to the invention of the wheel is 3500 BC. Thus it is possible that the understanding of the principles of rotation as it was applied in the spindle and the spindle whirl subsequently led to the invention of the wheel. Consider that people have been hand spinning for at least 6,000 years, and the spinning wheel was introduced into Europe only in the late Middle Ages or early Renaissance. Thus, for more than 5,000 years, as our Western culture relied on this little hand spindle alone to spin fibers, and they used it to spin silk, a lot. Uh, it was used, and it was used to spin the thread for the household linens, blankets, clothing, and even sails for ships. The fabric was made, the thread fiber was made using this. To appreciate the versatility of the hand spindles, we need only to call to mind the fineness of the Egyptian mummy cloth, the elegance of Greek and Roman textiles, the sophistication and variety of cloth used in the fashions of the Middle Ages. Moreover, hand spindles are still being used today by people on every continent. So in, in India and, and, the, and the Indians in this country and, and elsewhere are still using these. Now I'll talk a little about the different spinning wheels. Um, first I'm going to mention the, th the wheel that uh, came down from this, the first wheel, was what they call the wool or the walking wheel. And we have one, well it's back of the bed over here, it's, it's the big wheels you see. And they have a bench, 
uh, I think I'll get this one up to show you. I can show you some of the parts on this using this wheel, and I'll try not stand right behind it. Uh, this is the bench, and then the supports, or two supports for the wheel, and the driving band, which is a cord, and the, the head, and the spindle. Now the spindle is a long metal thing that goes through here. And the, uh, the pulley that, that turns it. Now the, the walking wheel was quite simple. One spun by drawing the fiber from the spindle, which was just a point on the walking wheel, if you look and look at that one afterwards. And you drew the, the, the fiber out with this hand and turned this big wheel with your right hand so that you had to use both hands to, to use them, and you walked forward and backward. You drew it off and walked backwards, and then wound it back on that metal spindle. So there are many names for this hand-turned wheel. Uh, it was commonly called the great wheel, the walking wheel, the wool wheel, or the high wheel. And in Europe, there were even other names for them over there. And undoubtedly, there were more hand-turned spindle wheels than the, this flyer treadle type. Um, these wheels were cheaper and easier to make, and thus were more widely used by the poor people in the cottage industries. They were also more often worn out or broken, and since they were not costly, they were not handed down as... Uh, prize possessions. The flyer treadle wheels were more expensive and more difficult to make. It is said of the wool wheel that in order to do a good day's stent of six skeins of yarn, that the workers' backward and forward steps amounted to a good 20 miles a day added to the steps of other household duties. So you did a lot of walking when you were spinning on that wool wheel back and forth and back and forth. Now I will mention uh, the one that is here in the library. It is over here back of the bed and it has what they call a bats or palm head on the back of it where the spindle is mounted. And they're driven directly by the drive band and the spoke turnings on that one are heavier out near the rim of the wheel. And that is uh, typically Midwestern, and it gives the wheel carry or weight so that it maintains its momentum as the woman turns it with her hand. And that, that heavier turning out by the rim is typical of wheels made in Ohio or Illinois and uh, our, as I said, Midwestern. And legend has it that this particular wheel here in this museum is, was owned by Ann Rutledge. And it could have been since it is a Midwestern type wheel and it was cared for. Now the next one I want to mention is, is what they call a railroad spinner or a long bed spinner. And I'll mention this briefly. I've, used, or I've seen one used once. And I think, Ben, that we have one up here on the ledge behind us here. And I think Ben had something to do with restoring this one, Ben Taylor, didn't you? Well, I got Mrs. Uh, Roberts, Emily Roberts, uh, to thread it up, and it's threaded up right. Red, it's ready to I go. Can't run it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never tried it, but the idea of this, they call it the long bed spinner. Uh, and, and they're not even pictured in any of these books of wheels, but the idea was to save those 20 miles of steps back and forth so that the wheel with the little spindle on, or the, 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 the spindle head part of it moved back and forth as you turned the wheel so that you didn't have to walk back and forth. It was a great idea, but I don't ever think it was that much of a success. It was so awkward to have, an, it couldn't, could hardly be in a home because it must be 10 or 12 feet long. Well, when you think of the size of an average log cabin yeah. these big families were in, yes. you your choice of 
walking back and forth a little bit or having this to sit down to. It took up an awful lot of room. It did. <laughs> so then from, that, from this uh, walking wheel, the uh, Saxony wheel was uh, evolved. And it has the wheel and the drive band and the bobbin and flyer. Now the bobbin is a little piece here that is just a little round piece that this cord runs on. And then this is a separate little spool here. And then this U-shaped piece on them, I don't know if you can see it or not, is called the flyer. And when the flyer was invented, that was a big change. Uh, then they, we have the uprights that, that uh, hold the wheel. And the, this down here is called the mother of all. And <laughs> it's where the tension, this turns the tension on, on the band that tightens the drive belt. And it sets in the mother of all, which slides back and forth. And then we have down here, they call this a footman. And this is the treadle. And many have this distaff which was used when they spun flax. They took the flax fiber and put it on here and tied it with ribbons. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of a wheel dressed with the flax on it for spinning. And then if you actually were spinning the flax, and, and uh, I, I have friends who do, you have to have a little cup somewhere to wet your fingers as you pull the fiber out because the flax, of course, is dry and uh, it's easier to work with if you moisten your fingers to do that. Maybe it would be best if I set this off on the floor right now. And then it, I, can, I can see you all better. The Brunswick or Saxony wheel is named after the inventor, Johann Jurgens and it's from his home area of Brunswick or, or Saxony. So these wheels are known as Saxony wheels. By 1480, the flyer was in use. The flyer and the bobbin revolve at different speeds, and thus the yarn winds on as it is spun. Legend attributes the invention of the flyer to Leonardo da Vinci. And there are, I've seen plans that he had drawn for this. But it wasn't produced at that time. He, he produced it many years later, and it, so they say they attribute the invention to Johann Jurgens, the flyer spinning wheel. Early in the 16th century, a treadle began to be used. This evolution produced the spinning wheel used until the Industrial Revolution. That way they could sit down and it, it was much more convenient. The majority of the Saxonies made in the 17th and 18th century were used for spinning flax. Small orifices. Now this spindle, the metal spindle I mentioned, has a hole in the end of it. And your fiber, your wool or flax or silk or whatever goes through that hole. And when they're small on a spinning wheel and the little hooks here are quite small, you know that it was probably used for spinning flax. Today, most of the wheels of this style have larger bobbins, flyers, hooks, and orifices so they can be used for heavier yarns, such as medium weight wool yarns. And I, mine do have because I've been spinning to hook rugs and things and I need a heavier yarn. Now the Saxony wheel that is in the museum here is one over in the case, right over here. I, I hope you can see it. It um, is quite upright. The wheel is cl quite close to this flyer, and these uprights are just almost straight up and down. And it, the, this one has a spoke turning, mostly seen in the Midwest. And that wheel is distinctive because of the unusual treadle arrangement, <coughs> which, <coughs> excuse me, which is the reverse of the common variety. The treadle arrangement throws the wheel back closer to the bobbin and flyer. And the article I was reading, the man knew of only two like that. He had one, and there was one in the museum that he had. So, actually, you have one here. This has the same arrangement, the upright 
where it's thrown back closer and then the treadle uh, goes behind the front legs instead of out like the one on the floor. So that was the first wheel I inherited and in, uh, I inherited a wheel from my great aunt and it has that same arrangement too where the where the wheel is quite upright and is close to the flyer. So with his two and this one and the one I have we know of four. <laughs> <laughs> we should write the man that wrote the book and tell him we have one too. Now the next wheels are these little parlor wheels and uh, they were of the late 18th century. They were also called boudoir wheels, drawing room wheels, or carriage wheels. And I guess actually some of the smaller ones when they, the women were riding in a carriage drawn by the horses, they were small enough they could put them in and spin. Many were made of fine woods, ebony, mahogany, fruit woods. Decorations included ivory, mother of pearl, tortoise, silver, brass, pewter, marquetry, lacquer, and chinosery. Spinning followed the pattern of the other handcrafts. By the industrial revolution, when it was no longer ec an economic activity, it became the pastime of leisure class. The small, elegant wheels were made for the aristocracy and upper middle class. Such women kept spinning wheels as a sentimental symbol of being housewifely. And it's of a housewifely virtue. And that's all they used them for. They looked, it made them feel like they were being very virtuous. I think I'll just stop and tell you a little story. We'll break this up. There were two ladies that were spinners, but it was some time ago. And the one lady wanted some yarn one day to do a project and she didn't have any yarn. So she went over to her neighbors and she said, do you have any yarn that I could buy from you? Well, the lady needed some money. So she said, well, give me till tomorrow and I'll look and see if I can find some. So she thought, what can I do? And she had a pair of socks that she had knitted. So she unwound the socks almost all all down and she gave them she wound them in a ball and she sold them to the lady that wanted the yarn well pretty soon a few days later here came the first lady back again oh i need a little more yarn she said i'm knitting a pair of socks and i don't have quite enough yarn <laughs> <laughs> now this little i'll talk about this little wheel for a minute this little wheel is in the museum here and it was brought to this country in 1845 and presented to the library by Mrs. Molly Liblin. And it's an unusual little wheel, um, probably from, of German, Swiss, Bavarian origin. And they were used for spinning flax. And I think the flyer on this one was replaced by someone who was not a woodworking person because the flyer is nearly always a curved piece and made in one piece and this is made of two little straight sticks mounted on this uh, back part of it with a nail but it works they they did a pretty good job I think it works I'm not even going to attempt it because this wheel is quite fragile um, and it has been very decorative. A lot of the, the, the decorative work has, has been lost. But there, ha, uh, there were all these little pieces on the inside, and then there were little ones on the outside like this all the way around. So that it was quite an elegant little wheel. And I, I, I guess it would have been used because um, it has what you call the distaff. This is what they would have put the flax on and tied it on and, and then spun the flax from that, but I have never seen one with this distaff mounted right onto the base of the, of the wheel here, onto the table. This is very unusual. And in the book, there is none pictured with this, and it is, is secured to the upright here with another piece of wood, so that it definitely was there and used this way which is, as I say, very unusual. To me, it would have been left-handed. Your flax would have been over here, and you're trying to work over here. But evidently, it was successfully used. But it is a very interesting uh, wheel. 
Now we'll just now go to some of the accessories that they used and, and we don't have a whole lot more to talk about on, on wheels. Um, the first accessories, I brought a nitty knotty, they call it. And you took the yarn from the spinning wheel bobbin, which is a spool, and uh, as unwound it off of there and you tied one in and then you wind it on here. And if I can get it going right, there's, you tilt it back and forth and go, one way you go around your arm and one way you don't. <laughs> anyway, there was, used to be a song they sang while they wound the yarn onto their nitty knotty. Nitty knotty, nitty knotty, two heads, one body. And sang the song as they wound their yarn off the, off the spools onto that. And it was more transportable too. Uh, another kind of uh, yarn reel is I stood one up here on the balcony. It has the arms that stick out, and there are six arms. You stand that by the end of your spinning wheel and turn it and wind it off the spool on your, on your wheel onto that. And it makes a skein. I took this off of my yarn winder at home, my yarn reel at home. When you take it off, it's wound like this and I took it off. I'm going to dye it now or, or do something, but from here you either wind it onto a bobbin for a loom or you uh, can roll it into a ball to knit from it or with it. Now those have a clock, what they call a clock in them, and it's a little thing that as you turn it, you count and it, it counts. After so many turns, and mine, mine at home, after 125 turns, uh, it clicks. A big loud click. And I heard one time the story that that was where Pop Goes the Weasel comes from. It was the popping of the, yeah. When I was touring Madison's house in Virginia, three years, whatever, not uh -huh. three years ago, the guy told that very same story, that that was. That was it. That was, was that's it. where Pop Goes popping. the Weasel originated. Well, that's interesting to know that you heard the same story. Where is it in Virginia? <laughs> oh, well, good, in Virginia. All right. Uh -huh. Before we got here, did we talk about a big spinning wheel like that? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> now, the, uh, the clock reel, uh, as I say, counts. And if you have the, re the, the yardage measured around your uh, reel, like mine holds a two yard strand then you know how many turns you have and you know how many yards of yarn you've made. Uh, gradually those, those little clock things in there lost some of the little wooden gears and I have one where they put little nails in to replace the wooden gears. <laughs> Didn't work too good, but it was a good try. <coughs> Another piece of equipment that you have here in the museum is the squirrel cage swift. Now that uh, swift is another name for a, 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 a thing that holds the yarn after you've spun it and have it in your skein. And up there, I don't know how well you can see it, but the, the piece that has the two little cages on it, you, you put your skein over those and it's adjustable so it holds it tight. And then you can draw it off of there to put it on your bobbins for weaving. Now most looms have uh, the shuttle and the bobbins that go in the shuttle. So you would wind your thread onto, onto bobbins for the shuttle uh, or for your weaving or into a ball for knitting. And one thing I didn't mention was that uh, here in the uh, case here, there's an unusual little warn, yarn winder. It's small, it sits on the table in there, and on the back end it has a place where you can put the bobbin and wind bobbins uh, with it too, all in one. You have the place to hold your skein and then you can unskein it and there are bobbins on the back, a, a bobbin winder on the back. So we're kind of winding up here, but I've got more to say, three pages. Uh, perhaps one of the facets of spinning which recurs over and over again is the sheep to coat contest. This was frequently done at county fairs and sheep shearing events. One such account from England in 1811 
concerned a bet made by a John Throckmorton that wool could be obtained in the morning, a coat made from that wool and worn to dinner that evening. The wager was for a thousand guineas. At five in the morning, two sheep were brought in. The fleece was shorn, the fibers spun, the yarn woven, the cloth dyed, dried, and finished by four in the afternoon. The tailor then took the cloth and completed the coat by 620, <coughs> and Sir John wore that coat to a special banquet that he had that evening for his friends in celebration of his winning his wager. The event was witnessed by over 5,000 people during which the shorn sheep were roasted and consumed <laughs> along with 120 gallons of beer. <laughs> it was later made into the, it was later made the subject of a painting by Luke Clint. Now I never have seen the painting, but it must have been quite an event. And the next thing that really surprised me was that they spun asbestos. When I read this, I thought, oh my word. And this is from a book written in 1979. Asbestos is a mineral fiber which does not burn. It has been used by hand spinning for at least a dozen centuries, but it is now considered a health hazard. Fabrics of asbestos can be seen in nearly every home since it is used widely for ironing board covers. So in 79, they were still using asbestos ironing board covers. And they had spun it for centuries. I can't imagine this, using this fiber as, as, as dangerous as they talk about it being today. And a story about it. A tablecloth owned by Emperor Charlemagne in the 8th century was made of asbestos. After dinner, Charlemagne would amaze his guests by throwing the cloth into the fire to clean it. After the stains were burned off, he would return the clean white cloth to the table. <laughs> I just can't conceive of that. And I can't imagine the damage spinning that asbestos did to people through the years. Just unbelievable. Then one thing I wanted to mention that in this Annals of Iowa book, it's a, a, a copy from the summer fall edition of 1985 has an interesting article in it on early production of fibers and textiles in southeastern Iowa. Tells of bathing the sheep, how they drove them into the river and scrubbed them and then let them out in a clean pasture to dry. And uh, told about the numbers of uh, early mills and the spinners and weavers. And there were mills in Jefferson County and Van Buren County, all around in here. And the amount of commercial carding was amazing. The peak year was 1850. The article is titled Home Weaving in Southeast Iowa from 1833 to 1870. And if you uh, ever are interested in it as being a local thing, that was, uh, was interesting to read. Today's spinners should, not, should most definitely be aware of the ancientness and richness of the development of the spinner's art. Any person today who begins to hand spin should have some feeling for the millions of spinners, mostly women, who from the beginning of time have picked, plucked, sheared, or in some way reaped the harvest, prepared it for spinning, spun it, wove it, and into some useful and beautiful fabric. Now, I'm going to talk just a second about the two wheels I brought with me. Um, I think we're running a little bit long here. Uh, the first I'll speak of is this one. This wheel I bought when I first started going to spinning things and doing demonstrating and so forth. And I had the wheel that was my great aunt's and I really didn't want to carry it around and, and I thought it might get damaged. So I ordered this. It's about to fall off on that one point. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that I would just order it and I ordered one, never seeing it. I ordered it from a little shop up in Wisconsin and they said it would be a cherry wheel. Well, it came and it was this lovely wheel. 
uh, you don't realize the workmanship that is in this. And it was, he had signed his name on the bottom. It was a Steve May, and it was made in 1976. And then it, in a very short time, I received word that this man had died. No details or anything, but I thought, well, I can't order a new part for it now because he's gone. But I never, and I never found out any more about how old a man it was that made it or who he was, but it is a beautiful spinning wheel and it has always spun so well. Now this other one I brought with me <laughs> came from Van Buren County. I had a phone call. The lady asked if I was interested in buying a wheel and I said, well, I might be. And I said, how much do you, would you like for your wheel? And she said, well, $5,000. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I didn't really think I was interested in that. So, but I said, it probably is worth that to you, but uh, you'll find it's not going to be worth that to most people. So she thanked me and uh, I thought, well, that's that. Well, then she called later and she had been investigating the prices of wheels by then and uh, made an offer that I said, well, yes, I would be interested now. So I went down to see the wheel and found that she was selling it because she was the, let's see, how did she put that? She was uh, the last of a family, uh, of her immediate family. And this wheel was owned by a man born in 1834 in Schmolz, Bavaria, Germany. He brought it to America through the port of New Orleans as a young man and gave it to his brother, Heinrich. It was later given to George and Margrethe, and I won't give you their name because I'll tell you why later, in 1888 as a wedding gift and said to be 400 years old. Now I had a man who knows spinning wheels who looked at it and said, no, it's not 400 years old. It has some metal nails in it and they didn't use those back when that long ago. So anyway, we bought this from the youngest daughter of a family of 10 children in 1988. And she sold it because she didn't want a big family dispute because she was afraid that so many of the children would want it, that it would cause trouble in the family. <laughs> so she sold it unbeknownst to them. And <laughs> I have felt a little guilty about it, but <laughs> I really thought, well, maybe I was saving some family dissension and, and, and saving them from having problems. And it is a beautiful little wheel and has worked really well. And it had yarn on it that belonged, her mother had spun. And she, her mother had always spun the wool and knit the father's socks because he wouldn't wear socks that were hand, or that were, that were any other thing. That he only wore the socks that were, the wool was spun by his wife and they were knitted by her. So there was still yarn on, um, on the wheel. So I, I took enough to, I crocheted a little doily for her from this and gave it to her. And after she was gone, I thought, oh, the, the family probably thought, whew, what's this? <laughs> and threw it away. But th this wheel has a history. Now there are very, very, very few wheels that you ever get a family wh wh history with the wheel. And this one I did have. She wrote me letters and letters and letters telling me about their family and the family history and everything. I'll leave that yarn out and you can see what a fine yarn it was for knitting the stockings. And that's all I'm going to actually talk on. I'll sit down and spin a little bit here. I'll card a little wool with the hand carders. Now at home I have what they call a little table carder and it cards a piece about this wide and about this long at once and which goes faster than the little hand cards. So I'll just, I will sit down and do a little carding and if you want to look at any of the, you know I was going to pass these books around so you could see how many, many, many different types of spinning wheels that there are. There are three books here 
that are from collections uh, of people. This one is from Ireland. They have a museum of spinning wheels in Ireland, and those are pictured in that one. The other two are both American, and, and you can see how many, many, many types. When I talked earlier about how many forms of machines there were for creating this wool. Lou, uh -huh. tell us how you made your colors when you started with the sheep years ago. Oh, well, yeah, we did have sheep and dyed with the natural dyes where I'd boil up the weeds and, and throw the wool in. And this rug uh, that I hooked, it was the first rug I hooked, uh, does have a lot of the natural dyes in. And over the years, they say, you know, that you can keep them from fading by using what they call mordants, which are chemicals, but they do fade. Uh, in spite of everything you can do to keep them from fading, they do fade eventually. So I quit using the natural dyes. Some of them were, oh, uh, goldenrod and, and, and uh, just about every kind of weed you can imagine made a color. I use the, the commercial dyes now because it's so, <laughs> I made a couple of needlepoint pictures and gradually they faded. The, the natural wool is still there, but the other is kind of gone. So that was kind of disappointing. Hey, Malou, uh -huh. you told me once about uh, you had a plant that just kept growing and you pruned it and used the prunings from the plant to make it. Yes, I tried. <laughs> that was a Swedish ivy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you know when you cut the Swedish ivy off, you get that makes your fingers orange, it stains your fingers, but when I boiled it up, it really just made kind of a blah tan. It didn't really do anything at all. I was disappointed. Did you get the rich brown there? That That's from a natural colored sheep. We raised the colored Coradale sheep, and the browns are the natural fleece color. And, and this vest that I, I knitted, or I, it was from a sheep this color. And as I told some of the ladies, you work and work and work on a project like this, and then you put it on, and you aren't that thrilled with it after you get done. <laughs> but, it, but it's warm, I'll say that. Um, oh, I made a pillow, too, <laughs> I, and when I'm hooking. And I made the, the little chair seat over there. That's another method of hooking. They call that Australian locker hooking. And the yarn is not spun, it's just pulled out and uh, you use locks of combed wool uh, running it through your base. But anyway, this was a, a pillow I've hooked. I've got another one on my uh, hoop at home uh, hooking it. This was our dog. And after I got the pillow made, the dog died. <laughs> he died at two years old. So here's his name, Trucker, and there he is. <laughs> So I think that concludes the talking part of it, and I will just sit here and you can ask me questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Craig with Channel 3, uh -huh. and uh, can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. You sit down and everybody's okay. stuff or whatever. Okay. Do you want me to just sit down and start spinning and then you ask me, or do you want to ask me now? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Okay. Well, I need to put this on this rug because the floor is slick enough that when I'm spinning, I'll push it away from me instead of treadling it. Now, I brought some wool to card, and I've washed it. Um, I bought a fleece this summer. And I'll put this up here. This is just the wool, the natural wool, if you want to feel it, how, it, it's full of lanolin. This is not washed. This is just right off the sheep. I bought this fleece. It even had a name. I think its name was Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Charlotte's fleece. Mm -hmm. When you use the little hand cards, you always use the same hand on the same card. This is one is for left and one is for right, and you always use them that way. Then you take the, now this wool I washed, so it's not as greasy quite as that right off the sheet, but you can spin it either way. 
and uh, a lot of people prefer to use it greasy. In fact, they used to <laughs> grease the wool to spin it in the old days when they'd bathe those sheep out in the river. Then they'd get them back to shore and they wanted to, after they dried them, then they had to grease the wool, which never appealed to me. There's a lot of lanolin in the wool, even after it has been washed, which makes the fibers move so that you can get them lined up. That's the point of this is to getting your fibers lined up and straight, you see. Then you roll it up. And this is called a rolog. I don't know where that name originated, but you end up with this little roll. And I had already spun. Oh, I need to tighten my wheel. You ha the wheel, as, it, as you draw this out, the wheel just twists it and draws it on. So that it's really not very complicated. Kind of the trick is to get it so that it's all the same thickness. And I've been spinning fairly coarse since I'm using it for hooking these rugs and pillows and things. And that's easy. <laughs> I guess you didn't do that the first time you tried. Really no, <laughs> no, it's, it's hard. When you're first starting, it goes in too fast and you're fighting it, or it gets tangled up in a big knot instead of going in. And it, it's, it's like riding a bicycle after you get the rhythm of it. And do, using different wheels, every wheel is different too. That makes a lot of difference. At home, I use a larger wheel, a Norwegian wheel that I have. One that was, is a new wheel, incidentally, in that it was made up in the Amanas by Rick Reeves up there, who has made hundreds and hundreds of spinning wheels that have been sold all over the country. <coughs> now he sold the business, and they're trying to make them more commercially. They're trying to make them on an assembly line, and I don't know how that's going to work. But uh, that's about it. Now you had a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is, uh, is spinning kind of a lost art? Well, it is, it is more or less. It was very popular in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, you know, there were lots of spinning guilds and a lot of women spinning, and they had spin-ins, they called them, where everybody took their spinning wheels. And a lot of people were raising the sheep, and, and it was very popular. Then it's, it kind of died out. And I think now it, it's beginning to come back again. I went to a spin-in this summer. I thought, oh, there won't be many there. Gosh, I didn't get there early at all, and there were just cars and cars there. <laughs> there were a lot of people there. And selling fleece, selling wool, sell, selling things they had made with the wool. So it's, it's coming back again. OK, thanks a lot. <laughs> OK. Thanks for letting me interrupt, everybody. <laughs> That's all right. Does anyone else have any questions? I told you I was going to show you that drop spindle, but I tell you that I'm no good at that anymore. I, uh, but when you think of how this was, how things were made for thousands of years, 5,000 years, this is how they did it. And I, I'm so klutzy anymore, I can't keep the spindle turning long enough to get it pulled out. It stops too easily, and I don't know how they, what the secret was to keep them going. But anyway, you get, when you get some spun here, <laughs> then you stop and you wind it on the, on the shaft here. And, and 
then you're ready to go again. <laughs> but as I say, one name for these is the drop spindle. And, and after you've tried it a time or two, you understand why. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's it. Uh huh. How do you get that uh, yarn to wind on there evenly on your? Oh, there are little hooks there, and that's what the little hooks are for. You move it from hook to hook. Oh, okay. It's up to you to keep. Yes, moving. you have to. Oh, you can spin cool. one roll log and then maybe move it to the next hook. So then it's evenly distributed on that wheel for you. Uh huh. How did you learn? Did you learn from a book or did Shelma teach you? I learned from a book and I learned from watching a lady and then I did go to Muscatine and take a few lessons. There's a Mary Zoller over there who was a very, very excellent spinner. In fact, she was the first one that I really thought I maybe would like to do that when I watched her spin because it was a beastly hot day and she was sitting out in, the, in Bentonsport at this little festival spinning away and she looked so serene and calm and I thought, oh, <laughs> maybe that's for me. <laughs> so that was when I got started and, I, and it was a she that I took some lessons from in Muscatine then. How long have you been spinning in one? I think that was about in 1972. So I haven't figured it up. <laughs> 26 years. 26 years? Oh, gosh. Now, Lou, when you raised sheep, <laughs> started from scratch, did you also shear? No. Oh, well, you left no. out a step. We left out a step. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had to, had to hire the sheep sheared. The sheep shearer would come and, and clip them all. One time I had a boy who was shearing away, and he sheared the sheep's ear right off. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, oh, dear. And I, I, it, it upset him, too. He was just learning, I think, I, I decided afterwards. Now, after that, I always called that sheep cut ear. That, I'd know that fleece was from cut ear. <laughs> Didn't you have a goat, too? We had some mohair goats, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where the mohair comes from. Uh, Angora goats, they're actually called, and, and then the hair is the mohair. And you don't have any of them now? No. No, no. We buy. I buy my fleece now. Still do this. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I said this. I'm hooking with it now, and I. Uh, most people hook with rags, you know. And I thought, well, I, maybe I was the only one trying to hook with yarn. But then I found the ladies in Eastern Canada use yarn to hook rugs. So. Would you put a back on that rug after you get it? Hooked? Well, on this one, I put some stuff on it to keep it from sliding, and then I found out I shouldn't have done that. They said, don't put a, a rubber backing. St uh, you know, I painted it on. No, that's just that rubber rubber stuff I put on the back that I shouldn't have done. <laughs> Why not? I don't know, really. I guess it over the years it maybe is hard on the on the wool. I don't know, but they just don't recommend it. Do you find it relaxing to spin? Oh yes, yeah. That's really why I started. It's it's so relaxing. Anybody else have any questions for Emily? I'm sure she will stay around a little bit if you want. To yeah, if anyone has any and questions. It's going to take her a while to get everything ready. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. Oh, well, you're welcome. Oh, well, thank you.